a question and answer session with the New Hampshire Department of Employment Security. And our guests tonight and our presenters and our answerers of questions are Karen Levchuk. And she currently serves as the general counsel to the Department of Employment Security. Karen has previously served in, in the New Hampshire Attorney General's Office and as the state's director of personnel. She's worked in the field of employment law in the public and private sectors. Also joining us, Lon Seal, counsel, who's been an attorney with the New Hampshire Department of Employment Security for more than 43 years. He passed the bar at age five. Um, <laughs> he's a former chair and vice chair of the Labor and Employment Law Section of the New Hampshire Bar Association. His presentations have included Demystifying the Unemployment Benefits System, Navigating the New Hampshire Unemployment Process, and the Unemployment Appeals Process and Reimbursers. He represents the New Hampshire Employment Security and the Joint Agency Task Force on Misclassification, Executive Order 210-3, and the New Hampshire Commission on Deafness and Hearing Loss. So why don't I start by turning it over to Karen and Lon some people have already submitted questions, and if you haven't submitted a question yet or after hearing some answers to the questions that have been submitted, please submit your question in the chat room. George Strout from NA New Hampshire and I, or Richardson, are monitoring that, and we will pass those questions along to our presenters. So, Karen and Lon, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, Very much. happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Uh-oh, I just lost Lon. Is he still here? I'm there. Okay. I'm here. All right. Well, I, I just want to welcome everybody. Um, we're here mostly just to try to respond to your questions, to try to provide a resource for you uh, in terms of the, the questions you may have about unemployment benefits. And you're in a very specialized area um, of unemployment benefits, to be honest. Um, you know, uh, school professionals and, and support professionals are really in their own world. And so fortunately with Lon's 43 years of experience, he's in a very good position to answer those questions um, because they're really inside baseball. They're, they're not like a lot of others. And just very, very briefly uh, starting out, as you probably all know, the unemployment rate in March of 2020 in New Hampshire was a little over 2%. Um, the unemployment rate by the end of April was 16.3%. And we're still, uh, we're still, you know, we're above that at this point, although the claims are filing, our claims filing rate is dropping um, even for continuing claims. So that's a good sign. It does mean that people are going back to work. Um, but one interesting thing to know is that over 200,000 claims have been filed at this point in New Hampshire um, and over $700 million in benefits have been paid. And the reason why that number is so astronomically high is that that includes the um, federal pandemic unemployment compensation, um, sort of a, a stimulus payment of 600 a week that has been going along with these unemployment payments. And almost 500 million of the 700 million that I just referenced is attributable to the fe federal pandemic unemployment compensation payments. So um, I think, you know, you kind of all know why the, why the unemployment rate is so high now. Some of the reasons are temporary employer shutdowns, employees hours being reduced, um, people who are ill providing care to a household member as a result of, of uh, COVID, uh, school closings, quarantines, and all of those things. But in any case, all of those factors, everything relating to the pandemic has, has put us in a very unique position at this time. Um, the agency, our agency has really been overwhelmed at times, um, and we're just all doing the best we can to try to help people out. And that's really all I have to say, and, and let, a, let us go right to the questions if you'd like. George? Yes, um, Irv okay. has the, the questions. Um, basically though, if I can summarize most of them, um, someone, most of the folks here have a, had a summer job or a lot of people had a summer job uh, lined up. 
the district will not be meeting during this uh, the summer or in session or, or offering any un, un, any employment opportunities over the summer. And I think that's the starting point for a lot of folks here. Are they eligible at that point for unemployment? Well, as you know, typically if an individual has reasonable assurance uh, between terms, the school wages are not usable uh, for purposes of annual earnings for the payment of unemployment benefits. Now, if somebody typically works a different job or is even self-employed during the summer and that work is not being made available to them this summer for one of the uh, listed COVID-19 reasons, potentially they could uh, receive pandemic unemployment assistance. If their regular job as an employee in employment is not being offered and they have sufficient earnings from that employment to entitle them to a lower uh, unemployment compensation weekly benefit rate, they could potentially uh, receive benefits based on that. But if those other earnings are not sufficient for them to uh, be entitled to a rate of regular UI and that employment is not available this summer because of a COVID-19 reason, they may well be able to collect pandemic unemployment assistance. George, are you having any trouble hearing Lon? No, not at all. Oh, good, okay. So that you can tell by the nature of that answer that we're in a complicated area. Um, you know, it's not, it's not as simple as I work for an employer I, and my employer is shut down. I work for a restaurant, my, the restaurant is shut down and now I'm going to file a claim for unemployment benefits and the um, employment security is gonna look at my earnings. They're gonna see if I had enough base period earnings in order to qualify for regular unemployment compensation. And if I do, I'll get unemployment compensation in the ordinary course, my regular weekly benefit amount, and added to that, I'll get the federal pandemic unemployment compensation bump of $600 a week. For people who are in the education field, it's just a little bit more complicated. So just putting it as simply as you can, Lon, um, really what it's gonna boil down to is whether the person, um, you talked a lot about wages. Can we simplify that, what, what you were talking about as far as wages and how that would be looked at? Well, the earnings in school employment are not available for use as annual earnings for the payment of unemployment benefits between terms if the individual has reasonable assurance of returning to the same work, uh, uh, say the end of August, beginning of September. And it will be easier, it'll be easier for people to understand, I think, as we ask, as we answer specific questions, and as when I say we, I mean Lon, as he answers specific questions, it will be easier to understand how this actually works. And many of, many of, of the members probably have already been through this process at some point in time and know how it works, but we'll try to be very specific about it. You know, we were asked, uh, we were told that there was an early question, and uh, if I may read it, uh, it was, I typically teach my summer camp program, which is paid for by student tuition that cycles through the Dover, excuse me, that, no, that was a different town, through the business department of my town and I am paid my hourly rate per our CBA. Uh, my town decided to make all programs this summer be held remotely, which forced me to cancel my camp. My camp is a hands-on art and science project, which could not be done remotely. Now, it may seem like a simple question, but when I, when I looked at the question, I realized that we would actually have to do a great deal of fact-finding to determine both whether there was eligibility, specifically what weeks there were, was eligibility, if it was eligibility, whether it would be through the regular state UI program, and if it were not payable through the regular state UI program, whether it would be payable under the pandemic uh, unemployment assistance program, we would want to know 
uh, how it was actually structured. Was it paid as part of the individual's regular school earnings or was it a real adjunct over to one side? If the individual did not uh, do that particular camp this summer, what would the percentage of reduction in earnings be that the individual suffered? Where do those weeks fit between the end of the regular school year and the beginning of the next school year? Uh, the details of how many weeks uh, are there, uh, does the re, uh, removal of the camp result in the individual not having a reasonable assurance for the next school year? Uh, so while, while it's a, a simple question, when we do the fact finding on these, we, we are going to have to get into the with, woods with people. And so if somebody believes that they're not working this summer when they typically would be, and they have a reduction in earnings, they should uh, file a claim and see if they're eligible. If there is no reduction in earnings, uh, then the fact that the school year may have ended early or the next school year may uh, start late is really irrelevant because the person has not both suffered a loss of when they were working and a reduction in earnings that would result in eligibility for a COVID-19 reason. So was there a part two to that question, Lon? Actually, there was. Uh, the, the same individual asked, would the fact that I stretch my pay periods over the summer change my eligibility for employment? I don't know how familiar you are with teacher employment, but this refers to an oddity about how teachers are paid. Teachers earn their full salary between September 1 and June 30. However, many teachers choose to receive smaller paychecks during the school year so they can receive pay paychecks during the summer. And the question is, does that affect the entitlement to benefits during July and August? And in as much as the individual has performed all the services on or before June 30th that would entitle the individual to the monies that are being paid in July and August, uh, the, the income in July and August would not uh, impact uh, their eligibility if they were otherwise eligible. Now we do, by the way, have a rule because it does talk about June 30th, and that is uh, basically uh, teachers with this contract that runs through June 30th uh, are not eligible for benefits for the weeks between when school actually ends and June 30th, whether school ended May 25th or June 18th or June 29th. So Lon, that was a question that I've I'm, this is Peter Miller from NEA, New Hampshire. Hi, thank you for being here. Excuse me for crashing into the uh, presentation. So the concise answer to your question then is it doesn't matter, it doesn't affect one's benefits if someone chooses to get paid during the school year or if they choose to have paychecks extended through the summer. That is true because all services were performed on or before June 30th. Now, there is, a, I'm sorry, there is a question here that talks about camps that have been canceled because of COVID-19, that that is the specific and given reason. Um, if that is something that you were scheduled to work at and have worked at, are you eligible to collect unemployment uh, because that job was canceled because of uh, COVID-19? Yes, that, that, that was the, uh, the first one. And uh, odds are, if that employment is normally scheduled after June 30th, so there were not earnings attributable to the weeks that camp would typically uh, meet that would result in the individual making too much money for those weeks to be entitled to benefits, uh, there's a very, very good chance that the person would be eligible. The person certainly should uh, apply for benefits and uh, find out based on the specific facts if they're eligibility. I mean, the two, two magic pieces of the question are, 
the person would typically be working. They're not. The person would usually be earning money during those weeks, and the individual has suffered a reduction in earnings based on a COVID-19 reason. Thanks, Lon. I have a couple questions here that really forecast forward to the fall. Um, they are, my job as a paraprofessional is affected by COVID-19 in September. Will I qualify for unemployment? And a second part to that is another person's going from full-time to part-time for the coming school year due to the COVID pandemic. Will they be eligible for unemployment for their reduced hours? So one, if I'm unemployed because of COVID or if my hours are reduced. Well, first, where you're talking about, uh, if you're talking about an individual that is not a teacher, if you're talking about an educational support professional, the way the system works for that individual is different than the way it works for a teacher, for example. If, as of the same date, a teacher and a uh, and a support individual, both have reasonable assurance that they're going to be working on this September. September rolls around, and in fact, neither of them have employment. The teacher is not paid retroactively. If the support individual has filed for claims all summer and their job does not materialize, they would be paid retroactively. Now, Finding of reasonable assurance can change at any point as well. If you have reasonable assurance right now that your job is going to start again in late August or in September, and you're notified by your school district in the third week in July, for example, that it's not going to happen, then you would uh, advise the department of that and we would determine that from that date forward, you no longer had reasonable assurance. If you were a teacher, we would commence paying you from that point forward. If you were a non-teacher, a support individual, we would not only pay you from that point forward, but would retroactively. Let me, um, let me throw in a question, Lon. Let me kind sure. of throw in a question in the middle there. So if I'm, if I'm an education support professional and or a para, um, paraprofessional for a school, and I'm not 100% sure, for whatever reason, um, my understanding of reasonable assurance is that with teachers um, and other professionals, they're ordinarily going to have a contract, either a written or an oral contract or something of that nature. Whereas for the paraprofessional, what they're looking for, for reasonable assurance, it's going to be based on whether they had a bona fide offer of employment. And a bona fide offer is not just a possibility that their job will exist, it's more than that. Um, and you also only have reasonable assurance if the economic terms and conditions of the job offered um, in the second period are not substantially less than those terms were previously. So what I'm, you know, one of the things that I think we're trying to get out there in terms of information tonight is that if for whatever reason there is some insecurity about whether you are going to have a job in the fall and you're a paraprofessional, that maybe you want to start filing in the summer. Am I right about that? Is that well, how it you works? Are right because to the extent that the individual has not filed for a week, they would not be paid retroactively if the job for which they had reasonable assurance, you know, at the beginning of the summer, it was really very likely that they would be working. Uh, this coming fall. If it doesn't materialize, they will only be paid for the weeks for which they uh, filed. Now, the earlier question also talked about half pay. The U.S. Department of Labor has indicated that a reduction in pay of more than 10 percent will uh, mean that the individual does not have reasonable assurance and will be eligible for benefits during the summer. So the main thing is you can't collect for any week for which you do not file. Um, and we're very strict about that. The law is strict. We're forced to be strict about that um, by U.S. Department of Labor guidelines. Um, and that's particularly true during pandemic times when there's the extra 
federal pandemic unemployment compensation, and they're being very, very worried about, uh, about fraud and putting all kinds of uh, fear into the hearts of state unemployment administrators about making sure we, we only pay what we should be paying. So, but in any case, all of this goes to make sure you file the claim if for whatever reason you don't have reasonable assurance. And we've just given you, I think a pretty good idea of, of to the best of our ability in this format of what that reasonable, reasonable assurance would be. But ask questions if you, if you have questions about it because we'll try our best to answer them. Okay, I'm looking in the chat room, uh, the chat function here. And Jody said that she's a pair who normally works summer school. Summer school starts June 22nd instead of July 6th. Due to COVID, they're doing it six weeks instead of four, and they're not hiring paraprofessionals. Can she apply um, on June 22nd? Because she normally would be working in the summer. They're not hiring paraprofessionals. So could she apply June 22nd? So this is a non-teacher, I'm correct? That's correct. Uh, I see no reason why, well, first let me say you could always file. The question is once you file, whether you're going to get paid. Uh, based on the question just asked, I would urge her to file. It sounds like uh, the facts may be such that there may well be eligibility because once again, uh, she would usually be working and she's not going to be, and she's going to have a re reduction in earnings as a result. And Len, I think this one may be similar. There's someone who's looking for an information regarding coaches' loss of income. Many educators also take stipended positions to coach and work with children in other situations, and those sports seasons are being canceled. So what would that apply? Now, is the sports, does the coach uh, usually commence performing services prior to the usual commencement of the school year? Um, I don't know for this particular person, but as a former coach, it depended on the sport that sometimes football and soccer went back before school did. Basketball often coincided with the school year. I mean, if the, uh, if somebody typically worked full time for quite a few hours the first couple of weeks before school was going to start and they could point to the fact that they were that was not going to happen this summer, they might be eligible for some form of benefits for those couple of weeks. If during the school year, uh, and I'm just making things up, an individual who is a regular teacher uh, making X thousands of dollars a year as a teacher, and they they are not going to get two or three thousand dollars for an extracurricular activity. That loss of income during the school year uh, probably would not result in an eligibility uh, for for benefits because for the weeks affected, the earnings would still be so high that there likely would not be eligibility. Okay. Come on, do you want to do you want to talk just very very briefly about high earnings, like how that how we look at high earnings at employment security? Well, individuals have weekly benefit amounts that range in New Hampshire at this point from between thirty two dollars a week and four hundred and twenty seven dollars a week uh, based on their earnings in their base period. Once somebody makes, I believe it's forty two thousand five hundred a year. Uh, they're at maximum. We disregard earnings equal to 30% of your weekly benefit amount. And what that boils down to is to the extent that an individual in New Hampshire has earnings of $555 a week or more, even if they're, ma they're at the maximum weekly benefit amount, there's no eligibility for unemployment benefits. So, hey, and I mean, just, I'm sorry, just to, or just to kind of close the loop on that. So to the extent that the stipend was an add-on to the salary, um, and it would be looked at at the time it would have been earned. So you'd have to look at whether the stipend, how much of it would be paid after the end of the usual term. Is that right, Lon? If it, 
yes, whether or not it was, there were weeks not during the school year that were impacted as opposed to the weeks that were impacted, the individual still was making $555 a week or more, they would still have, have high earnings and not have eligibility. So um, there are several, go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Lon. There are several questions along um, this line. This is from a person who said, what if come August and September, the school is open again, but my doctor says, because I'm 68 with serious health conditions, tells me not to work in the building until there's a vaccine. So how would that figure in if my job is there, but my doctor says I shouldn't go back to work for health reasons? Did you want this, Karen, or did you want me? Um, no, you go, you go ahead. I'll jump in if I want to. So uh, based on the criteria for pandemic unemployment assistance, it sounds like that individual may well have an eligibility uh, for PUA, even if uh, they're not eligible uh, for regular unemployment uh, benefits because the reason for their job separation or, or non-return is, is uh, unrelated to uh, their employment. So, uh, that individual right. may well be eligible for pandemic unemployment assistance. Right, and, and part of the, what, what we're talking about there is pandemic unemployment assistance is a creature of the CARES Act. It's a new form of benefit. In order to qualify for pandemic unemployment assistance, you can't be, you, it, the first determination we have to make is, is this individual eligible for regular unemployment compensation? If they are eligible for regular unemployment compensation, then they're not, then they will receive regular unemployment compensation and they're not eligible for PUA, pandemic unemployment assistance. So in this case, because the person would, might be barred by the fact that the school term had begun um, and that they have a job to return to, it would then be a matter of filing a claim and certifying that there's a COVID related reason that this person is ineligible uh, or is not able to return to work. Is that about right, Lon? That sounds right to me. Uh, okay. things, are, things are very, very different now because uh, a lot of people that simply are not eligible for uh, regular state UI, maybe they quit a job uh, in December without good cause attributable to the employer, for example, and they haven't earned requalifying wages. And let's say that individual just before COVID-19 shut everything down, that individual was offered employment to commence another job. And then the employer said, I'm sorry, uh, I know you were gonna work, uh, go to work here in my restaurant, but I'm shutting, I'm shutting down because of the governor's order. That individual would be eligible for PUA, even though they were disqualified for UI. I have a related question. Hi. Hi there. So, hi, my name's Stephanie. I'm co-president of the support staff union up in Tamworth. Um, related to this, in the realm of about the age you're talking about, we have some members that have asked um, if a person is eligible for social security benefits and then you lose a wanted job because of COVID, like the school board not hiring back a number of support staff. Are they, it sounds like they are eligible for unemployment, but I would like that confirmed. And then the other question I got was a couple of folks wondering about the fall and because none of us know this, um, what might happen with more infection, higher infection rates come fall or winter, if someone is fearful of working around a host of first, second, and third graders or kindergartners, and they feel they need to step away from work, are they eligible for unemployment benefits? So the first question, can you restate that? Because I, I, I think you so, said- So there, there, 
I'll preface it by saying our school board has not renewed any of our contracts, the entire support staff. We normally get our contracts, legal contracts, telling us our wages, our days, our hours in the first week of May. And they're having a school board meeting tomorrow, very late in June. Um, we're all gonna lose our insurance July 1st with like, we don't know until tomorrow. Um, so I'm hearing today that all of these folks can apply immediately and should apply immediately if they do not get their contracts tomorrow, anticipating Bethany, that they have no work possibly. Let me ask, yeah, let me ask one follow-up question. Are they worried about not being eligible because they are collecting some unemployment benefits if they're I mean, co collecting social security at this point? No, not collecting, but old enough to. We have people that are eligible, like didn't somebody just mention a 68 year old person? I think we do have somebody that old and others that are 65, but want to be working, aren't right. collecting. Well, the side question here is receiving social security does not impact right. unemployment benefits. Okay, good. Right, um, and there's absolutely no requirement, you know, we don't, look to see whether people could be collecting, because even if they were collecting, it would not impact their ability to collect unemployment benefits. Okay, thank you. Now, and let's hope tomorrow goes well. <laughs> if it does not. My fingers and toes are all crossed. But until that happens, it doesn't sound as though any of the uh, affected individuals have reasonable assurance. So unless tomorrow goes well, I would imagine we're going to have a lot of individuals opening claims for unemployment if they have. Yeah, a I'll encourage them all to go. And then what about anyone's fears here on the, the, the hundred people in this meeting about, you know, we all work with, well, many of us work with very young children and there's no way I'm going to be able to keep the first grade off of me. <laughs> I don't care how many barriers they put up yeah. and you know, people have, it's reasonable to be fearful of that. But if the school is open because, or a school, I don't mean my school, I'm just talking generalities, is open because it is felt that reasonable and safe, safeguards are put into place. But I don't think, we know there's really not a 100% safe anything with this illness. So. People are just wondering, well, what if I don't want to work in November because it's, I don't know. I don't even know how to phrase this question, and I don't know if anyone else does. Well, the but U.S. Is, Department of, What do you think? The US if you're just afraid to work, but the school is open, how about that? <laughs> the U.S. Department of Labor has indicated that just a generalized fear uh, is, is not adequate for payment. Yes. Oh, yeah. has, okay. uh, has a note. Sorry, go ahead, Lon. Has, has a note from their doctor. Uh, the doctor says you are at heightened risk, and uh, based on that heightened risk, you should not part participate. Okay. Well, risk. just in terms of what do you have to certify um, on the unemployment claim? You know, it, to a large extent, for the last many weeks, we've had a, a stay-at-home order in place that was issued by the governor. And, you know, many businesses have been closed as a result. And so that sort of took care of that aspect of it. And I think you're right, Stephanie, and I don't think we can really even answer the question of, as we get farther out, as sure. more businesses, as schools open, as other places open, but people continue to have concerns because of the nature of their work. Um, that is, it's not something that we can answer definitively at this point. Right. But if someone has a health condition that makes them susceptible and they need to quarantine based on the advice of, of a, a, you know, a healthcare professional um, or for some other reason, then, then that is certainly something that would be considered on the unemployment application as part of the, as part of the certification. Okay. I, I mean, we have folks that have been very sick and folks that take care of their parents and live, live with their parents and that kind of thing. So 
Thank yeah, you for helping. Right. Sure, and Thanks. if you're caring for a member of a household, that's one of the COVID certified reasons for, for collecting unemployment right now. All right, thanks. So the bottom line is thanks. anything more than just, I, I, I'm a little uncomfortable. If you can articulate anything that would put you or someone else at a heightened risk, you should bring that to our attention. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and I have a couple closed ended questions here. One is how many years does the um, employment security look at to determine expected employment? Is it the last year or how many year, what's the look back? So the look back for regular state UI is typically the first four of the last five completed calendar quarters. And then if for some reason an individual does not have an unemployment rate, we look at the most recent four completed quarters. For pandemic unemployment assistance, uh, that time period that we must look at is calendar year 2019. Okay, and is the law, if the loss of employment is due to COVID, is the filing form different? The, uh, yes. I mean, let's say somebody's just out of work for a regular reason that has nothing to do with with COVID-19, then that would not uh, impact potential eligibility for pandemic unemployment assistance. It would be uh, just like at any time. On the other hand, if you have a COVID-19 reason, uh, we have a rather extensive laundry list uh, on the weekly claim. I mean, for example, uh, Karen mentioned uh, a few minutes ago that the stay at home order uh, was going to be coming to an end here in New Hampshire. Well, we have a lot of people that commute to other states from New Hampshire. And if they were impacted by some governmental order in some other state, they would certainly certify to that on their claim. So yes, there, there are different questions if you are filing because of a COVID-19 reason. Well, and, and two, what happens through the claim process, and I'm, I'm always reluctant to talk about this because um, I'm, not the, I, I'm not the claim expert, um, but having said that, if, if I have a simple situation where I worked for a restaurant, my restaurant closed, and I'm applying for unemployment benefits, then I may not ever have to give my COVID reasons for being out of work. My, my business shut down. I don't have a job. I had a job, I was earning money, now I'm not. Um, and so I, I'm just not sure that every single one of our claimants has to do a COVID certification. But if you are out of work for a COVID related reason, which may involve a business shutting down, but it, there may be other factors, uh, you will be asked to certify your COVID reason. And the reason is that if you end up not being eligible for regular unemployment compensation, we want to be able to consider you for pandemic unemployment assistance. So for anybody where it's not 100% straightforward, and I, I'm, I apologize, I think anyone who's filed a claim recently would know the answer to this question, but I'm not sure we send you to the certification questions for COVID um, unless we need to, but I, I, that could be a, that could be a, um, that could be a, a, a dream on my part. Or a mistake. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Karen. I'm going yeah. to actually give George an assignment here. There's a question about what's the secure website to apply for unemployment. And when you say it, George, could I ask you to actually find it and put it in the chat room for people so they'll have the link? So, so how do I, what's the website? Where do I go to apply for unemployment? Lon, are you? Oh, I you thought you were asking George. <laughs> George says, oh, well, <laughs> the starting point, and, and Rich knows off the top of his head, the alternate, but you can always get there by uh, going to nh.gov and getting into the uh, employment security website. And on the front page, there are, are big buttons if you want to file for unemployment or if you're an employer that wants to set up a, uh, a work share plan, for example. So you right, can all... the very first button, I think, uh, as you look at the screen, as you look at the website for our agency, you know, going to nh.gov, it'll say, look for a state agency. 
And if you pull up New Hampshire Employment Security or just start by Googling us, when you get our agency, um, this, this first screenshot of the, from the agency's website, there'll be a big button on the left that says file a claim in red. Right, That's where you start. Posted shortly, here we go. Okay, and George, do you have it on your screen that we could share just briefly what that looks like for people? Uh, yep, hang on. I hope I described it accurately now. Yes. Well, sometimes it's easier to actually have a visual than... It, oh, totally. There you go. And so there's the button. File a claim for benefits. File my initial claim on the left. And there we go. George, thank you. I know I kind of put you on the spot there. I live for that, Irv. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, this person just wants to clarify again, a paraprofessional whose contract is ended is, and they were not scheduled to work for the summer, they're not entitled to collect any benefits. Is that correct? Their year has ended. They were not scheduled to work in the summer. And they have reasonable assurance to return to the same work this coming fall? Um, that I don't know from the questions, but take, the, no. take each branch. What if I do and what if I don't? Well, if you don't have reasonable assurance, all bets are off and you're, you would be eligible to continue to use your school wages. If you do have reasonable assurance and you've suffered no loss of employment, uh, you're not working uh, one minute less this, this coming summer than you uh, would have worked but for COVID-19, for example, or than you worked last year, then you, uh, you would have no loss of employment uh, for which to receive unemployment benefits. Okay, thanks. Here are a couple um, really down detailed questions. One is, how does collecting unemployment affect your retirement if you're a paraprofessional? And if you collect unemployment, what happens at tax time? Well, unemployment benefits are taxable and we do provide uh, claimants with the opportunity to elect to have 10% of their benefits uh, withheld and sent to the IRS. Uh, what was the other question? Retirement. Um, how does it affect retirement? It should not re uh, affect retirement at all. On the other hand, if I, if I am collecting retirement benefits and my employer in my base period uh, contributed to that retirement plan and those contributions uh, have uh, affected my entitlement to retirement, the receipt of retirement can potentially affect the receipt of unemployment benefits, but to my knowledge, not the other way around. Okay. I live in New Ham uh, Vermont, but I work in New Hampshire. Do I file in New Hampshire? Yes, you do. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes. Was it live in Vermont, work in New Hampshire? Yes. File in New Hampshire, right. Sorry, Lon. Not a problem. Uh, let's see. For anyone who lives um, somewhere else and has recently moved to New Hampshire, uh, or maybe they've been here for the last six months and they were working in New Hampshire and they're trying to file a claim and they're having an absolutely terrible time, it could be because their wages are from another state. I think probably members of our of department have talked about this. The states are trying very hard to cooperate with each other and report wages to each other. But if you, if the people who have waited the longest to receive unemployment benefits from us generally are people who are waiting for us to get information from other states, or we have information, but we have to do a manual process. And so hopefully we're, we're really catching up. We've been working very hard on that, but um, those have been, those have been very difficult in because of, of various, uh, technological problems uh, across the states. 
And that's, that's because of the options that are given to individuals. For example, if you're a claimant and you have wages in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, you have the, uh, uh, the option of collecting against Massachusetts, the option against collecting against New Hampshire, the option of collecting against uh, Massachusetts using both your Massachusetts and New Hampshire earnings, and the same thing in New Hampshire. You can use both states' earnings in New Hampshire. Those calculations basically have to be done manually, and the individual has to be given a choice. Thanks. This person, Mary, sounds like she's kind of caught in um, a bad situation in that she worked as a para for six years. She left her job to complete her teaching internship, she just graduated with a master's degree in education, and now has a teaching certificate but can't find a job. Is she eligible for unemployment? So she was a paraprofessional for six years. She left to complete that teaching internship, graduated, has a teaching certificate, but can't find a job. That's a tough we, one. Yeah, we would need more information, Lon, right? I, I think we'd need more information based on timing, whether or not uh, there was a, a contingent job offer that has not come to fruition. But if somebody just quit working a, a, a year ago and now they're having trouble finding work, we would need some sort of intervening, you know, COVID-19 reason that would make it, uh, that being the reason why they were currently unemployed as opposed to the fact that they simply left their employment at some point in the past and could not find new employment now. Having said that, certainly to the extent we can be of, of any service in uh, somebody regist registering on the job match system, et cetera, to try and find employment, we'd like to try. Right. Let me say that the, the easiest case scenario in that situation is where somebody actually had a job offer that was revoked because of COVID-19. In those scenarios, the federal government has provided eligibility, but where the person hasn't, didn't have an actual job offer and where they haven't been attached to the labor market for some period of time, that can be problematic. So we would need more information. Um, this person um, usually doesn't work in the summer, but they've signed a contract for the fall. If they don't go back to school, and they don't call me back, could they then collect an insurance, apply for um, unemployment insurance? So once again, if that individual is not a professional, they should open a claim in case they don't go back in the fall. Uh, if, if, they think it's, if they think it's if, if they're not sure they're going back in the fall, uh, they, they need to file so if they don't in fact go back, they can be paid retroactively. If the person is a teacher, and I, I guess the question would be, based on the totality of circumstances this year, can they articulate reasons why it's more iffy this year than it has been in past years? Uh, that could potentially go to whether or not there's reasonable assurance. Okay, and as we're kind of approaching um, the end of our hour here, what questions should we have asked? And I know there are more in the chat room. We're gonna save the chat and make sure people get those answers. But are there other things that were not asked that you think would be important for the 100 people on the call to know? We really Either. don't know what, what is going to happen in the weeks and months ahead. And it's going to be really quite fact specific. Are any, any individuals going to have their hours cut? Instead of having a partial week off at Thanksgiving and then coming back for three or four weeks and then having a winter break, are schools going to decide that once you leave at Thanksgiving, you're not coming back until January? If things like that happen, it's going to Im impact eligibility for unemployment benefits. Usually, uh, in, rather than me uh, going down that path, 
I guess as, as things go forward, uh, things are going to happen that we can't anticipate. It may well uh, impact an individual's entitlement. We have only talked thus far about between terms. There's also the within terms. A disqualification. For example, typically if somebody uh, gets the same week off uh, the, in March, they typically cannot receive benefits during that week. Well, what if that week is extended to three weeks? Well, uh, based on the federal guidance, uh, we would not pay benefits for the uh, week that the person was typically off and would pay benefits if there was a reduction in pay for the two additional weeks. So I, I think we're really in the uncharted waters and if someone is working less and making less, I would urge them to file a claim for benefits and make their case. Yeah, and I guess I would add that particularly for um, education support professionals, for paraprofessionals, if they had uh, an expectation of working um, in the summer, and if that job is not materialized, that regardless of all of the other conversations we've had, that there may, there may be eligibility for benefits there, that that um, may be likely. Um, and also, if they, have, if they do not have reasonable assurance of work in the fall, if there is any insecurity about it, if they don't have, um, you know, I think the way I described it before was, they don't have a bona fide offer. Um, and there's, you know, essentially insecurity about that. The only way to protect themselves from the, from the unemployment uh, uh, benefits standpoint is to file over the summer um, because, um, and actually, Lon, you were saying that they can, they can be paid retroactively, but they only can collect retroactively if they filed claims, isn't that right? That is true. So we don't really know what the future holds, but it seems like, you know, to the extent that this universe has, has always been a pretty well-known quantity, it's different this year. And so there's, um, you know, there's no penalty for applying um, and giving your information accurately um, and seeing what, you know, what happens as a result of that. I don't know that we have anything else. We can take a couple of extra questions if you want, but I don't know how how strict you have to be about following the time frames, Irvin George? Um, I think this is an issue of great importance to people and there are some more questions coming in. So I would just encourage people, if you have another commitment and don't want to stay on, feel free to leave. And the same for Karen and Lon, when you say, you know, let's wrap it up. I will save the chat and make sure we get back to people with their answers. I've got one here that says, I just want to make sure I have this right. I'm a teacher. And if my summer camp job isn't happening, and it would have started late June, I cannot start a claim until July 1st. Is that correct? I, I haven't looked at the calendar to see where June 30th falls in, in a week. Uh, but there's no downside, really, to the person going ahead and, and uh, opening their claim and indicating uh, you know, giving us the facts so we can go ahead and make a determination and... Uh, June 30th uh, is a Tuesday, Lon. June 30th is a Tuesday. Yeah, so, um, you know, the person may well, based on uh, that many days in the week, may well have, uh, have or may not have high earnings uh, for that week. I would suggest that they go ahead and open the claim, uh, you know, effective uh, the Sunday, a couple days before that, and uh, see, see how it falls. Lon, do you and mind if we stay on a few more minutes and answer a few I more questions? I don't mind Yeah, we don't mind, we're willing to stay. Great, Th I appreciate that from both of you. Um, this is one of the, I work in one state, I live in another state question, so maybe if you could answer um, this question and then make a general statement. This person is a paraprofessional in New Hampshire. They live in New Hampshire. They supplement their wages with a restaurant job in Maine. Their summer hours have been cut dramatically. They're not sure if they should apply in New Hampshire because they live there or Maine because they work there in the summer as a, as a 
restaurant job. Well, now that's an interesting fact pattern yes. because all of their non-school earnings are in one state and their school earnings are in New Hampshire. But in real life, when you uh, have combined school and non-school earnings, basically you have two weekly benefit amounts. One weekly benefit amount takes into account all of your earnings. The other weekly benefit amount uh, takes into account only your non-school earnings, but you, you cannot have a claim going in two states at the same time. So certainly if that individual files in New Hampshire, uh, they could do a combined wage claim to the extent that the individual uh, might potentially be eligible for, for benefits uh, based on all earnings if they didn't have reasonable assurance. And then uh, to the extent that their school earnings weren't usable, if we had done the combined wage claim, we could uh, see if they had an entitlement based on uh, based on just their uh, main earnings. That That is quite an interesting fact pattern. I may have to uh, send an email to the UCB director, the Unemployment Compensation Bureau director on that one. Well, and Lon, well, just, just oh, sorry, just to, just to simplify it though a little bit, what the downside, so, so it makes sense to file in New Hampshire, particularly if they don't have reasonable assurance and both the wages from New Hampshire and Maine may come into play in establishing the weekly benefit amount. But if the person does have reasonable assurance, are they better off filing in Maine? I don't know the difference in how much you can collect in Maine and how much you can collect yeah. in New Hampshire. True. Uh, you know, I, I, I think potentially that person may want to open a claim and uh, may want to look look at their combined wage claim options to see where it is most beneficial for them uh, to open their claim. Yes, and once the problem is, once you file in one state or the other, you've established a benefit year, and so it's difficult to, uh, to change that once, once that election is made. But they can open a claim in New Hampshire and uh, say, I'm looking at a potential combined wage claim, and I need you to run the numbers for me so I can choose between either uh, Maine or, or New Hampshire. And then if they choose to transfer there to uh, file in Maine, we would be sending the New Hampshire wages there. It, Terry's looking out for her colleagues and is concerned no one has mentioned bus drivers and it's not a specific person's situation, but what about someone who is employed um, in transportation and obviously with schools being shut down, um, they would qualify for benefits? So first differentiate between bus drivers that work for a, a private for-profit company. They're oh, not thank you. involved in this at all. Uh, they they're not impacted by the between terms disqualification. The uh, school bus drivers, the cafeteria workers, the janitors, the school nurse, those individuals are all in the category of people that uh, were, uh, we, put, we were talking about when we discussed educational support persons and they should file if they're questionable at all about returning to work in the fall. And if they don't get their jobs in the fall, they can be paid retroactively, even if they had reasonable assurance at the beginning of the summer. So there were several questions to that end, Lon. If, if I have a contract as a pair or I'm gonna go, be going back, I'm, should I file now in case I don't go back or they don't reopen schools? Is that your advice? Am I understanding that correctly? Well, or is not, that the reasonable assurance? I'm not looking for, you know, no. tens of thousands of people that are really pretty, are, are sure they're going back in the fall to open just in case claims. But if you have a reason to think that you might not in fact have the same job paying you at least 90% as much this coming fall, 
then you should open a claim because if the job does not materialize, you can receive benefits retroactively if you're an educational support person. Um, and this along those same lines, Linda has a question. If you are unaware that you could file, can you request it to be retroactive for the time that you could not work? So you're not sure. looking for thousands of applications, but you know, I could have applied and I didn't, and I found that out in October. Can it be retroactive or not? Well, first, for pandemic unemployment assistance, uh, taking retroactive claims to uh, when those individuals were first impacted uh, is actually a federal requirement. As to individuals that are potentially eligible for state UI, I, I, I guess they should uh, open their claim and then they should apply to uh, have it backdated and give the reasons why they, they did not file on a more timely basis. But, but Lon, it's not a slam dunk it when is not somebody a slam files. Dunk. No. But it's one of those, if you've got a valid reason why, uh, run it up the flagpole. And maybe for a last question, you could summarize, because there are many, many questions in the chat room around people who were expecting additional compensation from summer jobs because they cleaned in the school or they worked at camps and there will be less income for them. Could you, I know you've addressed it in a couple individual cases, but to summarize, could you summarize people who will have reduced income this summer, what they should do because their customary employment is closed because of COVID? See, they're in a heightened level as compared to those, say the bus driver that thinks he or she is returning in the fall and then ultimately does not and collects retroactively. You're talking about people that notwithstanding the fact that they may have reasonable assurance of returning this coming fall, they can point to specific employment this summer that they usually would have had and they're not going to have that employment and they're going to be making less money. And those people should open a claim and indicate uh, what, their, what their reduction in employment is and the reduction in earnings and see if they're eligible. Great. Um, I'd like to thank you to Karen and Lon for your willingness to answer questions this evening. And we have saved the chat. Um, George, can we put a link up to the, for that website to people? Yeah, I, for people? About every three questions I've been putting it up there. So. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so I thank you. Hopefully we're, you're not gonna get inundated with unreasonable or claims that aren't deserving, but we really appreciate your time making people aware of what their, the benefits are and what steps they should take to secure the benefits that they have due them. So, and I'm thank sure, you. Thank you, and I'm sure both Karen and I would be interested uh, if, if you receive uh, some questions that are, are new that we really haven't answered, I'd be curious to know what those are because probably this is not the last time they will be asked and it'll give us the opportunity to think about our answers. Yeah, actually what I've done, Lon, is saved all the questions and I'd be glad to share those with you. Wonderful. Maybe what we can do too is if we see, you know, questions that are recurred, that have, you know, are recurring, um, but they haven't been answered, especially try to get to those first. Um, but, you know, and we don't, we're not worried about people making work for the agency but I think one thing that you do worry about is we, we don't want people to feel like, oh my gosh, I went through this whole process and you know, I wasn't eligible and why did they tell me to do that? The, the reason we're encouraging people to file if you're in these specific categories um, is so that they'll be protected you know, in the event that, that the reasonable assurance wasn't there and, and the job doesn't come through 
um, and it will protect them and give them greater uh, economic security, which is what this is all about. Because we know it's a really tough time for people and that people are, are suffering a loss of income that they would normally have. Um, and that's what, this, that's what this program is all about. So we really uh, appreciate being able to spend the time with you tonight. And thanks for your questions. And uh, yeah, we'll definitely be um, willing to look at those additional questions. So let us know. Great. We appreciate Thank that. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, George. And thanks again to Lon and Karen. Good night, everyone. Stay safe. You as well.